And then there were the Tokyo War Crimes Trials. Rocky asked me, why were those trials so different from Nuremberg? Former State Department spokesman Hodding Carter once termed the Tokyo Trials the dog that did not bark. That was a good old Tennessee phrase which pretty well sums up the tone and outcome of those trials. For openers, the caliber of judges and prosecutors we sent to Tokyo was so different from the lawyers we selected to represent the United States in Nuremberg. Robert Jackson, after all, was already a top judge and a justice of the Supreme Court when he was chosen to be chief prosecutor of the Nazis. He worked with British and French top jurists in London for quite a while before the trials opened to develop the very important and groundbreaking concept of command responsibility. But when it came time to assemble the legal team for the Tokyo trials, we sent people who were either controversial or had very limited experience. Although Joseph Keenan, like Robert Jackson, was part of President Roosevelt's inner circle, a top criminal lawyer in the Justice Department and a graduate of Harvard Law School, he was thought to be a heavy drinker whose flamboyance often got the best of him. As one observer put it, quote, his knowledge of Asian affairs did not extend beyond chow mein. <laughs> Some believe President Truman gave Keenan the Tokyo assignment to ease him out of the White House because Truman inherited all Roosevelt's cronies. His own chief of staff said Keenan was so controversial we got off on the wrong foot. He did not measure up to the job. And then the Truman administration chose John Higgins, a Massachusetts judge whose limited experience was entirely within his own state, to be our nation's judge at Tokyo to sit on the panel. Although he grew in stature as the trials progressed, the United States message to our allies was clear. The Tokyo trials were just not that important to us. It was common knowledge that General MacArthur, after seeing to it that Japan's General Yamashita was punished for the sacking of Manila, he would just as soon have called it a day as far as prosecuting Japanese war criminals were concerned. Meanwhile, other allied nations were appointing their top judges to Tokyo. Australia sent Sir William Webb, who spoke fluent Japanese, unlike just about all the other judges, who had just presided over trials at Singapore and who was selected to be chief judge at Tokyo. Britain sent its leading barrister. China sent the chief prosecutor of the Shanghai High Court, an honors graduate of Stanford and the University of Chicago. France, France sent the chief prosecutor of Versailles. The Soviets sent their commissar of justice. India sent its most prominent justice, as did New Zealand. The Netherlands sent its leading professor of law. The Philippines sent its former attorney general, a member of its Supreme Court. All justices, except India's judge Radhipadam Paul, signed a statement pledging to pursue justice without fear or favor in the Tokyo trials. Powell voted against every conviction or death sentence for the next two years. And later, he told a group of reporters that he admired the Japanese for showing India how to get rid of white colonial rule. So we had a ringer on the Tokyo bench right from the start. But the two greatest drawbacks to achieving justice in the aftermath of the Pacific War were the constraints placed on Prosecutor Keenan and the ample opportunity the Japanese had to destroy incriminating evidence in the weeks between surrender and occupation, and those were three very crucial weeks. So unlike the situation in Germany, where our tanks rolled into cities and right up to Nazi headquarters, and we seized a huge paper trail. As Keenan prepared to board the plane in Washington with Robert Donahai at his side, a courier drove up with an envelope containing two instructions from the White House. Under no circumstances was Emperor Hirohito to be implicated or placed on the witness stand, and Keenan would be allowed to cross-examine Tojo. Can you just imagine if Hitler had been alive, you could be sure Robert Jackson would have had him on the witness stand. When Sir William Webb learned that the U.S. would not allow Hirohito to be tried at Tokyo, 
He threatened to conduct his own separate trial, and for several weeks he was sent back to Australia to cool off. And the Russians were furious that no Japanese company heads were put on trial for their most obvious roles in the planning and prosecution of the war. Mitsui, which until recently was the third richest company in the world, lent the Japanese government billions to finance the war. Robert Donahue told me that he and a fellow investigator tried very hard to establish enough of a paper trail to indict the detained company heads for Class A trials. But everyone said they had followed the Japanese government's August 16, 1945 directive, that was the day after the emperor announced surrender, to destroy any documents, quote, which might be embarrassing to us, unquote. And that's what the secret message said. Another investigator, William Gill, sent to search for evidence at company POW campsites said time and time again the Americans were told, oh, our documents were destroyed in the bombings, or oh, we were told to destroy everything and we did. We knew they were lying, Gill said, but what could we do? We came away empty-handed. 